Okay, uh, so as I said, I, my name is Gurkham. I work for Red Hat on various projects. One of them is Eclipse J. Um, I don't know if you heard it, but the major contributor to Eclipse J was a company called Code Envy, <coughs> um, which was acquired by Red Hat like six months ago, give or take. Uh, so um, I work um, with Eclipse J, but in addition to Eclipse J, I work with several other tools, including uh, JBoss tools, VS Code, VS Code Java, OpenShift IO. Anything that has to do with developer tooling, I'm kind of involved in that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Eclipse J uh, and demo that in the context of OpenShift IO. So the talk will be more about Eclipse J, but then the demo will have OpenShift IO as well. So what is J? Has anyone used J before? What do you think it is? Yeah. It's a web ID? I said a weird ID. <laughs> weird ID. OK. <laughs> any, any other ideas? Web-based ID. Yeah, it's a, it's a web-based ID. That, that's basically what, most, what is most visible about Che. It's a web-based ID. But actually, the, the thing that excites most people and myself as well is it's a cloud workspace. So there is a web ID there. Yes, it needs to be there. But then it actually, what it does is it, it does workspaces for you. And what is a workspace? A workspace is basically your runtime container plus all the tooling that you can have to run with that container so that it's a workspace. So you, you can actually uh, compile your code, get content assist, uh, do builds, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and the, the brilliant thing that Che does, better than Web ID, because that's weird. <laughs> We're fixing that. <laughs> but that will take a bit of time. Uh, six months or so, but the bril brilliant t thing that, that Che does is it takes a, a, a container that you would normally use on your production environment and dev modes that. And dev mode means that it puts all your tools to it and hooks them up with your web ID. Uh, we have some people who are actually using a non-weird web ID with, with Che. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, I, th I am not sure if I can actually reveal their names, but some of the big companies there, they are doing that sort of uh, thing as well, taking the Che workspaces and then using that together with their web IDs. <coughs> and, you know, it, it puts your debuggers and so on and so forth. Um, it gives you uh, Git tools. It gives you access to a terminal for instance, as well, so that you can, from your web ID, you can just access to your, your uh, container, wherever your container is running. You don't, you don't really need to worry about that part. Um, and then, of course, the, the good thing about being a web ID is, uh, why am I not able to go back? All right. Well, the, the good thing about being a, a container-based ID is you can easily share that. You can just say that, OK, here's my container. Here is the state of my code. These are the changes that I made. You know, just take that container. Can you take a look at this code? What is, what is wrong with it? Can you, can you just, you can just share a container. You can just take your workspace and send it over to someone and say that, hey, can you, Take a look. This is what I was debugging, and this is what I see on my debugger. And you can just send that state of, of the container to someone and share that. So when you say container, is it like a Docker-based container? Or? Excuse me? Is it like a Docker-based 
It is a Docker-based container, yeah. Yeah, it is a Docker-based container. And of course, if you are into that sort of thing, you can just reach it from anywhere during your holiday from the beach. <laughs> and of course, the other thing is it's a workspace, but it's just like any other platform. It's, it's like VS Code or, or Eclipse or uh, that you can actually have plugins that runs in that workspace. So let's say that um, we, we have some, we call them agents. Um, we have some uh, very necessary agents that are, uh, that we are shipping together with Che, like Maven build support. We, we ship that with Che or language server for JSON. We ship that with Che. But then if, let's say that you have an obscure need for a build tool, call it grunt, and you want to integrate that to a workspace, then th that is possible. It, it's, it's just a workspace agent that we can just add to your workspace anytime. And, and I'll show an example of that. So the workspaces are, are or what, you, what someone can put into a workspace are uh, pluggable, so you can add your own agents to it or implement your agents for a workspace and others can just reuse it. Uh, so what does the whole thing look like? Uh, it's basically, when you look at Che, uh, you have two containers working, or two, two servers, let's call them servers for now, uh, two servers working. Uh, one thing called, uh, we, we called web Workspace Master, and that actually has all the bits and pieces for managing your, your different workspaces. So at one point, you can run multiple workspaces, right? Uh, you can have a workspace for implementing your microservice A, and at the same time, you can run another workspace for implementing your microservice B, and you can do a switch in between the two uh, like that, and you don't need to do any changes on your, on your uh, environment because your workspace is already configured to, to uh, develop that, that, that. So what I mean by changes, so if you have any environment variables, they are already remembered and, and, and it it's basically comes with the container technology, right? Uh, it's already there for you. And if you have any uh, files or, or, or uh, that needs to be uh, checked out, it is already there, uh, done for you. So switching between the workspaces is easy. So we have a master, and what master does is when someone needs to create a workspace, it creates the workspace for you and starts the web ID. Uh, if someone needs to share a workspace, it does the sharing for you. Uh, it manages the, if you are in a multi-tenant or uh, 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 setup, it manages the permissions for you. Um, and it also serves an, a REST API so that tools can integrate with it. If you want to automate uh, workspace creation, yeah, that's fine. You can do it. There are APIs for it. And then, of course, inside the browser, you have the weird ID, which is HTML, CSS. It's actually GWT. That's why it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it, it uses GWT, it's mostly a GWT application. Uh, and inside that, it has a code editor, UI widgets, and, and whatnot. So what is OpenShift IO? Uh, has anyone heard of OpenShift IO? So this is different than OpenShift. Shared the same name all the way to IO. <laughs> this one is IO, that, that one is OpenShift.com. So the difference is, this is basically our DevOps developer uh, packaging together. So it includes Che, but it also includes other stuff. It includes uh, build servers, it in includes uh, planner, uh, it includes analyzers. So we will take a look at that as well. And 
how does this chain look like on OpenShift IO? Uh, so this is our, our typical production environment as we have it today. Uh, OpenShift IO actually works or runs on top of Amazon. Uh, the persistent volumes, uh, so it runs on OpenShift, which is a Kubernetes uh, implementation. Uh, so the, um, the persistent volumes runs on, on top of Amazon EBS and then for every, um, uh, remember I talked about uh, multiple containers. So for every user we have a Che host and the Che workspace or multiple Che workspaces more than, it can be more than one. And they are just projects, uh, just pods inside a, a namespace. And that namespace runs on a 16 gig gigabyte RAM node. And we have, a, I don't remember, 200 or so nodes that are allocated for OpenShift IO right now. Um, so, and when a user wants to spin up a new workspace, basically it's just spinned up by OpenShift and well, we'll take a look at that at the point. But logically it looks, this is how it looks on OpenShift IO. Demos. All right, I'm gonna show this in the context of OpenShift IO. Um, so in OpenShift IO, well, this looks too weird. Can I make this any better? What? I want a bit smaller. Oh uh, yeah, uh, you want uh, Yeah, this looks better. Yeah. So uh, all right. So um, I've been trying a few things uh, in the morning. So uh, what I'll do is I'll pretend that I'm starting from scratch and won't show you the existing stuff. So the th first thing that, that you will notice is, let me go back to my home, is in here you have a list of what is called spaces. A space is basically a container for your workspaces, your work items. Work items are basically your issues on GitHub, right? Uh, and or your builds. So what I'll do is I'll just create a, a workspace creatively called another test. And then with this one, you will be able to select templates. I don't know why I'm not able to select today, but basically we have several templates. So if you wanna do scenario dr driven planning, that, that, that's one template. And if you wanna do scrum, that, that's another template. It, that, will, that mostly affects how your planner is, is uh, organized, but that's, that's what it does. So I'm gonna say create. So it creates a space for me. So it's just a, you know, a, a, a container to put everything relevant together. And then uh, and you can import an existing code or you can just do a quick start. Um, and quick start is more interesting, therefore I'll do that. And in the quick start, you have several application types and so on and so forth. Since we like work text, we're going to select work text. And after you select work text, of course, you select your um, organization and so on and so forth. This is basically what goes to your POM XML, right? Let's not change anything. And this is, here is one, one thing interesting. At this point, you need to select a pipeline strategy. So this is basically how your builds will work. So it comes with three selections. You can do a release. That means that the build goes directly to your release. Or you can do a release and stage. It, goes, it rolls out to stage. And then you can do a release, release stage approve or promote, which is the most interesting one here. I'll just select that and I think these are the old. Yeah, you can select 
make some changes to your uh, Jenkins space names and so on and so forth, but usually that is the skipped part. So what it, it, what it is doing right now is it's actually generating a GitHub project for me, uh, putting the quick start code into the GitHub, uh, generating pipelines, be, meaning setting up Jenkins builds and stuff, uh, and, and provisioning all that on OpenShift. So if I go here, you can see that it actually created this project for me, do me do, do, did a uh, initial import. Um, you know, it's just starting code. Let's stop, let's say, okay. And now let's go into our uh, space. So now I'm in my space and you can see that there are code bases, stack reports, pipelines. So let's first look at the pipelines before we go into Che workspace. So you can see that now that it knows that there is new code in it, it already kicked up a build. So the build already started and you can actually just go and view the log. Yeah. This login usually doesn't do that. I don't know what I have done with my account. Now it requires me to do two clicks. So you can see that the, the build is going on. It's, it's your regular um, Maven build on a Jenkins pipeline. Who's providing the Jenkins uh, infrastructure here? Is that OpenShift? It's OpenShift. Okay. Yeah, it's this is all running on OpenShift.io. Oh, let me just show you that. Uh, let's go here. So in the environments, you see that there is like test, stage, and run. These are all OpenShift environments. And on the applications, um, well, there isn't anything that has been deployed yet, so that's why we don't see it. But the build has started, so let, let's continue, let the build continue for a moment. And then when I go to my code bases, I see all the code bases, meaning the Git repositories that are associated with uh, with with this space. And I can actually create a workspace out of that code base. So I'll just do that. A workspace is basically your Che workspace, right? Uh, it will create that and start the workspace. And what the workspace will be doing is it's going to look into my project, discover that it's a work Vertex project, and then say that, okay, so this is a Vertex project. This is the image that I should be using for Vertex project. So we do make some assumptions uh, when we are matching your runtime environment with your project type. But otherwise, once it does that, it will just pull in the stack images, put your tooling into it, and then import your project into that workspace, and then we'll start it. Um, yeah, I think t pulling the image takes a bit of time. I'm probably doing it for the first time on this account with Vertex. But yeah. So there's more things that belong to your account, right? So like you probably you have a GitHub token that you've given your account. Oh yeah, uh, when, when you first register to OpenShift IO, you can associate a GitHub uh, account with your, um, with your uh, OpenShift IO account. And once you do that, uh, it will hold on to your um, token and do all this uh, with that. And what about the Jenkins? Is there, do you have plugins that you configure for your Jenkins installed? Or is that just stock? Uh, it's, it's stock with selected number of plugins. But you have access to the Jenkins console Yeah. Okay. once it's set up for you. Oh, yeah. The workspace is up. And you have your code here. You know, your POM XML is generated and all that. Um, let me go here. So once I'm in, and the editor kind of works as you would expect. Um, it actually has a JDT behind the scenes. Um, 
So I get code assist and, and whatnot. Um, you know, the usual hover support is there, if I can manage to hover. Um, what else I can show that is interesting? I mean, there is nothing that is essentially different from a regular IDE that, that you would expect. One thing that we are doing right now is we are replacing all this with the infrastructure that we had for VS Code. So it will be using the Java language server from Eclipse instead of its own hacked up JDT. Um, um, that will come with the Java 9 support and, and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, your content assist is there. Your, your code is compiled uh, incrementally. Oh, and you have access to your terminal. So if I go in here and run a command, see, I'm on a Linux. I can do top. <laughs> so, um, what else I can show? Oh, let let me let me. Uh. Question, if I may. Is that I was looking at web-based IDEs for a while, uh, a while ago, because I was considering uh, Chromebook for doing a little bit of work, like while in transit yeah. or yeah. In the coffee shop. One thing that a lot of them were working on, but nobody <coughs> got to work, was offline editing. So once you lost your internet connection, using like local storage to be able to continue to edit, is that something that Che does? Okay, so Che. No, not really. So there is, uh, there is some sort of a buffer, but that won't be enough for you for a long term. So like for five minutes of loss, we can compensate for it. But if it is longer, probably uh, it will start to go north. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, that's a very fair point. Uh, it's something like, that like we I said, none of the a bunch of commercial off offerings all had it on their roadmap. Nobody actually had it working. So, so I, I just I'm curious. I'm so sure. I own the roadmap for Che. It's not in our roadmap, That's but fair. It, <laughs> but it's sort of it's, like it's, it's something it's that may actually happen because for of something that it else that is in our roadmap. But we can oh. talk about that. Um, so. Uh, let me just show you how the how the run works on in here. So I'll go here and just say run. Uh, what it will do is it will start running it. I'm I'm actually just running it as a Maven uh, Vertex plugin thingy. And what it does is it actually generates a preview URL here. Uh, so it's succeeded deploying my vertical. Uh, it generates a preview URL here, and then when I click on it. It will just take me to the application, and I can just you know type something, invoke it, and it's running. Right now, what it is doing is it's running on OpenShift from my workspace, and my workspace is an OpenShift container as well. Um, so technically, yes, uh, but they need to know the URL. It's a generated URL, so it's kind of. So if you ch share it, yes. So it, it is y running there. Yeah. So how do you update the, the Sorry? Container? How do you update the container when you finished? When, when I finished? How do you update the container? Oh, it's inside the container. It's inside the container. So it's basically just, uh, so yeah, let's make a change and see what's happening, right? Hello, Toronto Jug. Right. So what it will do is it will just pick it up that I made the change and deploy it again. So if I go back here, invoke it again, we'll just. So it, at this point, all everything is happening on the workspace container. Um, we do have support for multiple containers. I can show you that as well. Uh, that's very interesting. So in your workspace, you can say that, hey, 
start my workspace, but while starting the, the workspace, start these comp containers as well. You can say that, hey, start me a MongoDB and, uh, and, and, and a microservice B. And you can also set it up so that you can just tell, since you can set routes on in here, you can say that, oh, if I'm referring to this URL, just direct it to a microservice that is running on my production. I want to just use that. So you can come up with very creative workspace recipes and put that in here and it will just provision it for you. Uh, coming up with the, this creative workspaces kind of takes a bit of getting used to how Che handles things. So uh, that's, for instance, in our roadmap to make that more efficient, more easier for, uh, because that's a very interesting thing for us to make it easier to develop in a microservices world where you have five microservices that your microservice is using. Uh, and you, you will have the chance to just use two of those microservices from your staging environment, one from production environment, and another one from the one that you compiled. So that sort of setup should be relatively easy than um, to do than today. OK, we t looked at that. Uh, what I want to do is I want to go back before I do a git commit to our pipelines and see what happened. So what happened with our pipelines is it actually just did a build and uh, it rolled it out to state. So if I go back to my environments, you can see that, oh, I have something here on my staging environment. And if I go here, I can scale it to different sizes. I can open it. So this is these two, this one and this one are different applications. Look at the URLs. This is my staging container. This is my workspace container. So if I do this, I'm actually still looking at the old version that is in the Git, Git repository, not on the workspace. So let's go back to the pipeline. It says input required. Would you like to promote version 101 to the next environment? Sure, promote it. Yep, it's approved. Let's go back to my environments here. Uh, one thing I want to show is to let's look at it on the OpenShift console, how this project looks. So this is my staging environment. I have a run environment and a Jenkins environment. These are all pods running my Jenkins. Well, actually, there are two pods on Jenkins. One is running the content repository. Uh, if you have multiple pipelines, uh, in that case, we are caching your Maven repository so that we don't download the internet all the time. And then in your Che, this is your workspace, which is a pod running, and this is the Che server, the WS master. Um, so let's go back to the environments. And in my run environment, now I have another uh, pod that was created for me because I promoted the, the staging to run. So now it's in my run environment. And if we go back to the OpenShift console, the pod is there now. It's just starting. Now it's started. Uh, so. One interesting thing here is there's something, there's this little thing called stack report. Uh, during your build, um, OpenShift IO also do, does code analysis. So behind, the, with, behind OpenShift IO, there is a service uh, that generates these stack reports. What it does is it looks at your dependencies and so on and so forth and do, does an, an analysis. So if you have any security problems uh, in, in your code or in, in, the, in your dependencies, it, it, it gives you that. 
it gives you a list of uh, licenses that are used and it gives you some sort of a recommendation for your dependencies. Uh, in this case, it didn't like this for some reason. Uh, let's see what th is the reason. Uh, it didn't like the version. It, yeah. Uh, so it says, <laughs> so it says it should be using three four one. So at this point, I can try to fix it myself, but I don't know this very well. So I'll just create a work item if I know how to click. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know, but. Yeah, so what it does is it creates a work item. It's basically a, a, a Jira issue or a GitHub issue. Um, so it's now in my backlog. And if I go to the board view, you can see all everything here that is feature. But let's call, was that a task? That was it? Yep. So those were the bugs. So this is like a Kanban board, right? So you can just move it to, oh yeah, it's now in progress. And you can change who is assigned to it. I don't think I have too many people in my, <laughs> in my space, but you can invite people to your space and so on and so forth. But once, once you have that, you can assign it. Uh, so that is a Sorry, what was the question? So I was asking what, what underlies the detection of framework versions and licenses and all of that of the information that was there. Uh, um, so the open source project is called Fabricate Analytics. It's basically a machine learning sort of uh, thing that goes in and and um, and looks at the usages on different repositories and, and learns from it. So that's where the recommendation comes from. Uh, the CVs are from the usual, your usual places. Uh, but you know, the, the recommendation that was just done is that that comes from a machine learning thing that I don't understand. You may also <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's something like that. That that does. <laughs> so um, okay, so we did that. Uh, let's go back to our workspace. I want to do a git commit. I think I made a change. So let's do a commit. So it, it sees that I have made a change before. Of course, it doesn't fit to my screen anymore. Well, what if I, yeah, I will do that. Yep. All right, uh, so my test, and I want to push it to the master and say commit. So what it did is it did the commit. And my commit is probably somewhere in GitHub now. Let's see. Yep, it's here. But what is interesting is, of course, what happened to my pipelines. <coughs> Let's go back, back to my pipelines. Oh, there is a new build because there was a new commit, right? So what it will do is it will do run the build for me. It will do the stack analysis. It will go in all the way to the staging area and then wait for an approval. And once you do your testing on your staging and you can share the URL for your staging area um, with anyone. Once you do that, you can just t tell it to be deployed to your run environment. 
Um, okay, so this is my applications view. Now that I have actually stuff on my staging and run, you can see the version that is on staging and the version that is on run. You can scale them. You can see the OpenShift console if you want to. And um, yeah, the planner is here. Okay, so let me go back to my. So one thing that we have done, uh, you have seen the, ah, if I can make it work. My clicks don't work today or work too much. So one thing that is interesting to look at here is with, you have seen the analytics, right? How many of you are familiar with language server protocol? Okay, so uh, language server protocol. So you have seen the, the, the stack report and in the stack report, there is like an analysis service behind the scenes. What we did is we actually implemented it a language server protocol language server that talks with the, the uh, analytics service. So what, you, what it does is it looks into your J, uh, packet JSON or Palm XML or it nowadays supports whatever Python supports and whatever .NET supports uh, as well. So when you are inside that file, the language server will kick in and do the analytics as well. I'm hoping to show that, but I need to find like a version that is tainted. I don't know if there's one, so I'll just do some phishing here. Not sure. But uh, right now the language server does a bit more limited analytics analysis than analysis than, than the stack report does. What it can do is it can give you uh, uh, warnings about using uh, versions that is known to have security problems. So that's something that we do before commit. So we, we kind of separate before and after commit but in between. So that is something that you want to do before commit. If you are trying to use a version that is known to have security holes in it, that's where, where we warn it. And it's a language server. Therefore, it can be, it is used on Che, but we are going to release it to Eclipse and Visual Studio Code as well. Okay. Does the editor have a keyboard shortcut? Yes, it does. Um, and here you can, where was it? Why am I not seeing it? Oh, here. You can set the key bindings. And you can introduce your own, uh, so it's sort of a pluggable thing. Um, yeah. Uh, let me show the, I'm not gonna do a multi-container um, thing, but all right. So this is Chase, where Chase uh, dashboard. Um, what dashboard does for Che is it, this is your way of managing your workspaces if you are not in OpenShift IO. If you are in OpenShift IO, we kind of do the managing of things for you. So OpenShift IO tries to be the smarter version of Jenkins, smarter version of um, Che and, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it does, uh, we introduce some intelligence to this packaging so that uh, you don't have to worry about these things. But if you wanna go and get your hands dirty and uh, that dashboard is your way and with dashboard, you can see that we have stacks. And in the stacks, well, some of the stacks are uh, let me just show you that. Uh, you can see that 
some of the stacks have multiple machines and you can think of a machine as a container. So the DB machine, for instance, that's basically your MySQL. So remember I told you about um, you, when you start your workspace, you can actually deploy multiple uh, uh, pods together with your, your, your uh, workspace. Basically, this is how you configure it. You can say that, hey, I want a DB. And the source is just an image. It can be any image pro on any registry. You can just introduce a registry to um, uh, Che, and then it will just pick it up from that registry. Uh, you can change the, the configuration so that, uh, I guess I'm going to have to. Uh, you can change the configuration so that, that you have different levels of, of, of RAM allocated to what? And then remember, again, we talked about, so this is my developer machine, which is the workspace. And we talked about different agents, right? So for this recipe, uh, we come with Bayesian LSP server, which is the analytics bit and a terminal. But let's say that you want to do C sharp then we have a C-sharp language server you can just add to your stack. And once you start your workspace, your C-sharp tooling will be initialized as well. Or if you want to do file sync, so this will basically have the Unition file syncer in your workspace. So that is something that, that some people use for um, syncing their uh, local workspaces with cloud workspaces. Um, then there is the, we have a play PHP and Python support JSON language server. We are about to put the uh, YAML one uh, in as well. And then we talked about environment variables, right? You can introduce a new environment variable to your workspace. So that's where, where you don't have to worry about different environment variables. It will be set for you, uh, available for you. And when we talk about servers, uh, it's basically the protocol and the port number. Why is this important? Why do you need to identify a, 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 a server? A server basically tells us that we need to set up a, some sort of routing from outside into that port. Remember that when I started the application here, I had a preview URL. I had a preview URL. The, the, the reason that I could have that preview URL is I told uh, in my stack definition that there is a server running on in, in, in this port number and set up routing to it. So this basically instructs uh, OpenShift to set the routing to my uh, container. So let's go back to my OpenShift console. I think it will make. Um, so in my Che environment, if we look at uh, routes, you can see that I ha it already set up something. It's like there's a code server, an executive agent. There is a server running on 222, which is uh, and then the terminal is here. There's a debug port for to Tomcat. At one time, some of these may be used or not. It depends on what you're doing at that point. If you have the debugger running, you are, you are probably using the debug port. But if you don't, then at that point, nothing, uh, the, this route actually goes to nothing and, and OpenShift will just say that application is not initialized. So I could show a few more things, but if you have any questions or, yeah, this is now waiting. Let's promote this one too and see what happens on the applications. So any questions? So this is free. 
Um, and you can go to openshift.io to register for it. There is a wait list that they are going over. Uh, they are now accepting around 50 uh, users per day. I signed up today. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. You, will, you will wait a bit. Really? I know the list size. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, just, I was like, straight to the project. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we are, well, it depends on, I guess, how you sign up. So uh, there is a wait list uh, that is slowly and surely getting uh, worked on. Um, okay, I the code envy, that's what you mean, right? No, the code envy IO is something that we inherited through the acquisition. Um, yeah, yeah, the code envy IO doesn't have, it only runs Che. And, and yes, you can do that right now. It only runs Che. It doesn't even run on, on top of OpenShift right now. Um, the OpenShift IO is the one that has the wait list. Uh, so the platform itself is open source though? If I wanted to run OpenShift yeah. IO on my own server? Yep. Expected. If you go to Fabricate Project, all of it is there. Uh, the only bit you probably won't be able to run is the, the analytics because it requires the data and you know getting that data uh, is just going to take a lot of time and CPUs and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So th that is like a, there is like a whole different cluster for just collecting the data right now. Um, uh, when you have a team, how does that work? Does they, everybody has their own workspace? No, uh, projects, so you can share it space. Oh, let me just, so there is this OpenShift IO space. This is basically the space which the OpenShift IO team uses to manage its own stuff. So if you look at the code bases, this is basically all the code bases. So answering your question, this is all the code bases that exist on, on, on OpenShift IO. And everything is basically just upstream fabricate stuff. And if you go to the planner, <coughs> these are the items that people are, are working on. Oops, what did I do? <laughs> and you can see the sprints, sprint plannings, and so on and so forth. So uh, when you share a, a, a space with your team, uh, you, it's basically shared, the, the, that space is shared among all the members. So even if I delete all my spaces, actually we have that as well. You can just tell uh, OpenShift to delete everything you will never be able to delete an, a shared space. So, um, sure, but what do you mean by that? Ah, yeah. Okay. So, when you are sharing, do we support uh, co-editing? Is the question? Yes. No, we don't officially support co-editing. Yeah, that's something that, that we want to do. Uh, <coughs> but one of the implications of that is going to solve that other problem. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting sort of problem, because like, there's one other app. There's a plugin for Eclipse that will let you do remote co-editing. Um, it's not distributed pair programming? Yeah, effectively that's what it's supposed to be for. Yeah. But apparently it's, uh, it, it's a little flaky. Yeah, we so it'll be interesting to see how it works out because it's not an easy problem to solve. It's not, and uh, there is there is actually m much more involved problem behind it the, uh, because we need to think about multiple language servers working at that code as well. So you need to think of so think of the case where I'm actually defining a function in a in a class and you're defining a function in a class and I invoke the code uh, assist. 
the function that you have defined, I need to be aware of on my code assist, right? That's when you get it right. So that's the problem that, that we want to solve we, and say, claim that, hey, we, we support co-editing. <laughs> It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, we have a guy who can do that, but I don't think he's convinced yet. <laughs> 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 so. The, 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 the funny thing is we, we didn't really have, so what happened here? So we didn't really have too much problem with, or we kind of know what we need to do to solve the co-editing problem in the, in the same editor. The problem that we don't know, we don't have an answer to is what happens with the terminal. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you ha do, can you do co-terminaling? <laughs> or what, what, what happens with get support, right? Who gets the credit for the commit? We don't want to create a like, <laughs> or the blame. <laughs> Exactly, so. <laughs> yeah, so it's not about sharing the code base, it's actually doing the editing at the same time, right? So right now the, 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 the current thinking is basically what you said as well. One, one person owns everything and the, the others can just type on the editor. Yeah. They can select and put emojis. I think we're going to be done, right? Okay. So, yeah, um, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you.